And the first thing I want to say in terms of the title, okay, is that religion and the churches have a lot to say and have said a lot about the economy. But I also have a question. Have religions, particularly through its churches, entered into a transformative dialogue with the business community? The second area that I want to focus on tonight has to do with ethics and business ethics, some of the things that maybe you're concerned about in terms of fraudulent bankruptcies or uh, dis disregard of the law. There is already in place ethical regulations for the marketplace. Business ethics, ethics of almost every profession engaged in business, and statements of ethical social responsibility on the part of corporations linked with and identified with their core values. My question is, why did this not stop the meltdown? Third, and this is, uh, this is kind of the solution that I would look at. <clears throat> Instead of ethics coming and uh, ethical, uh, ethics and ethical standards being dictated by the churches, whose church, which ethics, right? Instead of being uh, ethical values and standard being coerced by legislation, can we find an ethics from the inside out? In other words, I believe that religion and ethics need to learn how to enter into a supportive and transformative dialogue with business. You know, the churches and religions in general, I speak more from a Christian perspective, and forgive me if, if I offend somebody if I, by using the word church or something, uh, but... Uh, Churches have always been in a creative relationship with those things were at, which are at the core of human enterprise, human living together. At one point, religions blessed the fields and offered sacrifices to the gods for fertility. There was a healthy and a creative relationship with the business of farming, of agriculture. At another time, as the world became industrialized, religion thought through the misunderstandings or the abuses of industrialization. Those kinds of abuses that made children just cogs in the wheel and workers replaceable parts. And it entered into a creative and transformative relationship with labor at the core of business. Okay. The support of labor unions, for example. In, uh, in, in a monarchical times, they prayed for the king and queen, they uh, crowned them because in a sense, they were the symbol of the business, the core enterprise governance that was so essential to human living together and human thriving. And yet somehow, religion doesn't know how to enter into a creative dialogue with business today. It's almost like we have tainted business in our mind as the business of business is business. The business of business is to make money. Business is of its nature immoral. And the religions don't have that kind of creative relationship. And I think that is, uh, not, that, not that there's any total, uh, total uh, what would you say, total protection against any kind of suffering 
or hurt or disaster in our world, whether it comes from a flood or a hurricane, or whether it comes from betrayal. Before that, I want to just uh, focus on the three things that we see in popular wisdom about uh, the meltdown. The failure, the welfare of the entire species, someone said, was thrown into jeopardy by the reckless behavior of financial wildcats, whose behavior in some cases was tolerated, even supported by mainline governments. You know what I'm talking about, right? Even more, this commentator, Dermot O'Murchu, said the U.S. President Barack Obama described as shameful and irresponsible the behavior of the leading bankers in the United States. Okay? And, and that's popular wisdom that explains everything that's happened in the last two years. The meltdown, it goes, was the result of the decisions and actions of a certain number of individuals and corporations which became part of an order of risk. It became part of an order of risk, a culture of risk that endangered not just the players but brought on enormous collateral damage. If I fall off this thing, there'll be a lot of damage to my collateral. <laughs> okay. Uh, but in addition, the crisis, and this is something we all know about, the crisis had hit the general, un until the crisis had hit the general public and ruined so many lives, few, if anyone, denounced the greedy power that promised unrealistic wealth to all who had the ante to get into the game. And this popular wisdom is defeatist if you take it to its core because it says two things when you really listen to it. That business is unethical, it's ungovernable. And that would explain the beliefs and the choices that led to the meltdown. And the other part of it is that we live in a culture of selfishness. And that would explain the greed that encouraged and took part in these uh, schemes and promises to become rich quickly. And if this is so, then why are we even bothering to talk about religion or ethics? So the first thing I want to address is, is religion, okay? Religions are not silent and have not been silent about business choices or the economy. From an Asian perspective, I'm going to read you a couple of things. The heritage of Confucius is captured in the following record. In the reign of the Emperor Hui, the common people succeeded in putting behind them the sufferings of the age of the warring states and rule and subject alike and ruler and subject alike rest in the cessation of conflict and so the world was at peace punishments were seldom meted out and evil doing grew rare while the people applied themselves to the tasks of farming and food and clothing and prosperity was abundant. In the Hebrew scriptures, in the tradition of the prophets, Amos contrasts a religious vision of business with the following curse. Listen to this, you who trample on the needy and try to suppress the poor people of the country. You who say, when will the new day be over? When will the new day come so that we can sell our corn and Sabbath so that we can market our wheat? Then, by lowering the bushel, raising the shekel, by swindling and tampering with the scales, we can buy up the poor for money and the needy for a pair of sandals and get a price even out of the sweepings of wheat from the floor. His lamb. 
Okay, I'll read a quote from Islam. Allah Almighty says, I have sent, Madian was sent, what, to the Madian people, Shu'aib, one of their own brethren was sent. He said, O my people, worship Allah. You have no other God but Him, and give not short measure or weight. I see you in prosperity, but I fear for you the penalty of a day that will, that will compass you all around. O oh, my people, give just measure and wait, nor withhold from the people the things that are their due. Commit not evil in the land with intent to do mischief. And in the shared Christian gospel narratives, we find this story. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard, and he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day, and he sent them to work. About three hours later, he went out and he saw others still unemployed, and he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. Three hours later, he went out again and hired more. And near the end of the day, he went out a last time and saw still some idle men whom he hired. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found, uh, and, and uh, he said to them, you also go in my vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his supervisor, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And the workers were, who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. And so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more than the denarius they had agreed to work for. But each one of them received also a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble and ask the landowner, these men who were hired last worked only one hour. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day? But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you to agree to work for one denarius? Okay. The question is this. All of these have bearing on business. But as I said, as one businessman said to me, Every time I hear one of those stories, all I can think of is the money I'm going to lose. Okay? There seems to be a disconnect with the accumulated wisdom of religion over the centuries and in many different cultures and countries and the logic of business in North America and indeed across the world today. And I want, to, I want to try to understand why that is, okay? There are ethical voices. <clears throat> As I said, business ethics, standards of practice, regulatory uh, laws are in place. So why the ignorance or the disregard? And I said there's a, there's a failure too between the ethical core of, the pe of, of, of people and the workplace. What do I mean by that? Is that most of our ethical knowledge, our ethical learning, takes place as children in the home. And we can go into the work world with a lot of good values of compassion, of respect, of truthfulness, but then we get into a world which is outside of our ethical reference and we get lost right and when you ask people about why they work or what's going on uh, their answer and ethics their answer sometimes is, is is revealing or betraying if you want sometimes I hear the answer from people that say well you know what I'm, I'm just making a living that's all. So don't talk to me about ethics. I'm just trying to get some food on my, uh, some money, take home a check, 
and, and, and take care of the family. In, in extreme case, I, I think of the bricklayers at Auschwitz. You know, there they are laying bricks, making a crematorium, you know, making a gas chamber. They, 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 in for their mind, they're not doing anything unethical. They're simply earning a living. Okay? Another thing is, well, you know, I, I'm fair to my customers. I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't lie to them. Okay? And that's, that's going up a notch. But they say, I'm just small. You know, what, what can one person do? Again, their ethical uh, upbringing. Okay, can you, can you learn ethics is, is the question that's underlining this. And that's, I think, the question that we're all facing today. Can ethics be learned? Okay. Other people say, you know, you got to figure out the cost-benefit ratios. Okay. So let's say, let's, let's say I'm, I got to cut costs on the mine I'm digging. And uh, so, what will it cost for me to get fined for having an unsafe or a dangerous mind compared to how much time I would lose or how much profit I would lose if I actually shut down the mine long enough to make those repairs? And so, often people deal with ethics as in the cost ratio analysis. And the fourth thing I hear often, uh, and somebody said it tonight, it's up to the regulators. The government's got to do something about this. So what I'm suggesting is that one of the, one of the reference points for trying to understand the role of religion and ethics in relationship to the economic situation in the world today is to recognize the disconnect between religion and the marketplace. And to recognize the disconnect between the ethics we grew up with and the ethics that are required in the so-called neutral or amoral world of work. That last thing is important because if you look at those four responses that I let, let out, uh, mentioned, read out to you, is a lot of people see business ethics as something imposed on business from outside that business of itself wouldn't embrace. I want to challenge that tonight. But as long as we have that mentality, then people in business don't have to own the ethics. It's up to the enforcers to catch them. Business ethics will not be effective until they are part of the moral consciousness of those who do business. And the best chance for the ethical conduct of business occurs when ethical norms are based on the intrinsic goods of business. And as I said earlier, Religion in the past has been able to see the intrinsic good of food and the intrinsic good of farming, for example. If you go up to Newfoundland, any Newfoundlanders here? No? Okay, well, anyway. So, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see some of the parish priests or some of the bishops or the uh, leaders of the United Church of the Salvation Army will bless the fleet before they go to fish and pray for the safety of the fishers, the fishermen. You're not allowed to say that. You have to say fishers now because fishermen is sexist. I'm too old to know any better. Okay? But how do, how do you make that come about? How do you make morality grow in the consciousness of those people who do business? The change of consciousness is not, and moral consciousness in particular, is not just the act of an individual who decides, I am going to be good even if everyone around me is being bad. That's not how it works in society. That's not how we influence each other. We influence each other. You know how medical ethics started? Medical ethics began in the 1950s. Okay, as a, as, a, as a separate branch of philosophy, not when religions or when philosophers were raising issues, 
But when doctors were saying, oh my God, I feel bad about doing this. I don't know if I should do this or not. Who can I talk to? They talked to other doctors. Other doctors talked to uh, each other and they would have actually groups, small groups, not organized, not, you know, we're going to have a, a meeting of the Ethical Doctors Association. That, but there were people saying, my God, there are changes going on in medicine. That I don't know if I can maintain my integrity and still do some of them. Or I don't know if I can maintain my integrity and not do some of them. But they talked together. And when they needed help, they called upon their priest or their rabbi. Someone said, hey, I've got a good priest or I've got a good rabbi. He'll come in and we'll talk to him about it. He may have ideas. And they got in touch with ethicists. And gradually this field began. Okay? And the same thing can happen in the business world. People, you know, one of the things I... Uh, one of the things about practical theology, which ethics is practical theology, because it's how do you, what do you do next, right? Is that the knowledge that we need to decide on what to do next can't simply be found in the holy book of any religion. It can't be found simply in the traditions of the religion because it depends on knowledge of the world that exists in the experience of people who are in the world. Okay? And so that's why that dialogue has to come together. If you guys, and some of you are in business, if some of you are in work situations that, re, that raise some ethical concerns, you've got to talk to other people about it. You can't just will it. Okay? A dialogue takes place, a discussion takes place, and then there become these little points where people, where people can, uh, can, can, can uh, associate with, where ethical consciousness can grow, where a religious commitment can develop. Okay? And these things work like leaven. They, they, they become part of public opinion. They become part of social consciousness and they can influence and bring about the changes. I am very skeptical that religion and ethics as outsiders to the business world can affect the kinds of ethical or religious changes that we need. Now, religion has tried often by making statements that, were, that are based on what in the Christian tradition we call natural law. Ever since Enron, do you guys remember Enron? The conversation in the business world, the conversation around the purpose of business has grown. And religions, building on their experience of centuries, have a right to take part in that discussion. So I'm not ruling, when I say these communities are important, I'm not ruling out the role of of organized religion, because I think they do have a right in our society to have to, to have the equal rights of citizenship, as everybody else. You don't get disqualified because you believe in Allah. Right? You don't get disqualified because you have a, a, a Buddhist shrine in, in, in your home. But we will, religion will not be heard if it sermonizes or if it tries to get government to impose standards on business or to coerce, as it were, virtuous behavior in the business world. And unfortunately, churches have often politicized their methods and come up against dead ends that freak out people over whose religion is going to get imposed on which group of people. Okay. And yet we have great wisdom that needs to find a place for discussion and things that perhaps you don't know, and I wouldn't know if I didn't have the script here that uh, Sister McTill wrote for me. Okay, uh, They have things for you to think about and you can bring up and they can be part of a discussion. For example, the Catholic valuing of the common good is compatible, is, is rather, is not compatible with an unlimited free market capitalism, okay? If 
you know that you, you say, okay, I, I'm going to do this thing with the stance. I'm not going to go in there and say, uh, 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 oh, I didn't know that. You go in with a kind of a stance. Well, what's behind that? Why isn't uh, the sense of the cow common good uh, compatible with an unlimited free market capitalism? Okay? Well, a free market capitalism insists that the distribution of wealth must occur according to the dictates of market forces. And this theory supposes that the common good will take care of itself. You know, the, uh, when the tide comes in, all the, all the ships rise, you're right? Including the ones with leaks in the bottom? Mm -mm. Okay. This theory, okay, while in its social theory, and I'm going to give the example of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church withholds confidence in the automatic benefits, be beneficence of market forces, it insists that the in, that the end of the end result of market forces must be scrutinized and, if necessary, corrected in the name of the common good and the inherent dignity and value of every person. Okay, for what are described as market forces are really policies, systems, and actions that are triggered by the decisions of often greedy human beings. So tonight I suggest that we engage in a courageous type of uh, reflection, okay? Not the blame game. Because we've all said it, you know, it's those greedy buggers and those selfish lying cheats and we're all suffering because of that, you know. But that doesn't usually help us. We ask ourselves tonight the question, what is the good of business? What good is business? Okay. We want to challenge the conventional morality that says the good of business is to make money for the shareholders. Okay. We want to reject the conventional moral yardstick, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Okay? Why? Because those are old saws that cover the reality. They blind us to the reality. The greatest good for the, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So why, and I don't have the statistics, but why is 90% of the wealth of the world in the hands of 5%, you know, why is the great, is the, is the people who are rich today in the world, and I mean including myself and you and I, we're richly blessed in many, many ways, compared to the number of people who just live from day to day in tents and shacks and favelas, okay, in refugee villages, in refugee camps, who belong to uh, uh, classes that are untouchable or uh, beyond reach, they're most of the world. The greatest happiness, the greatest number, well, the greatest number isn't getting it, okay? We have to remind ourselves of the meaning of the common good. How are we doing for time? Should I shut up? Keep going? Okay. Here's what I think. This is what I think in terms of a, of a solution, uh, towards a solution, okay? The, the ethical beliefs of the public, the outrage, the anger, the stuff, the stuff that you see sometimes in the Rob Ford movement. I'm just killing myself here with my... What people, anyway, associate with the... What people associate with the backlash that they that some commentators say is, is what's behind the Rob Ford uh, movement or the Tea Party in the States, okay? I'm not saying that that they are the norm, but I'm saying that there's, there, there are a lot of concerns, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of opinions in our society about what's wrong with this economic meltdown. There's mixed opinions about the bailouts, and the uh, stimulus stuff, okay? It's brought Congress in the United States to a position 
where it refuses to govern a country that's in desperate need of governance because they just stalemate each other all of, all of the time. So the first thing I have to say is that the ethical beliefs and concerns of the public must be included in any discussion of where do we go next, okay? The conversation cannot be limited to experts. In the public debate on what kind of society we want to live in, how a society through its legitimate governments responds to the meltdown and its consequences, Okay, ethical considerations can't be suppressed in the name of expediency. We need to revisit the accusations that we've heard from every person who's been kicked out of their homes by foreclosure. We need to listen to the jacques of the people who uh, have been unemployed for the last two years. We have to listen to the people whose pensions have been destroyed because of the investment fiasco. Okay. What needs to be done, not just to right the system, but to right the wrongs that have been inflicted on people as collateral damage. Even if, even if they got sucked into the euphoria of wealth overnight, and even if they made some dumb investments, we still have to respond to the hurt and the suffering. The religious beliefs of a country's people and their ethical concerns must also be included, but in their own voice. You just can't have the heads of the church speak for you, or the uh, head of a religious grouping speak for you. We have to find a way to speak it, speak it ourselves. Those who wish to exercise ethical and religious leadership will have to find ways to create forums that are integral to the forming of public opinion. So, in my view, the, the role of ethics and religion is not so much to supply, much less dictate the ethical norms governing justice in the marketplace, but by fostering participation in the public discourse, they can help clarify and shed light on, they can help us apply reason to moral solutions of these problems. Not only to get the financial system back on its feet, but to repair the damage done to lives and families and communities across the, the globe. Okay. Uh, the present global crisis is an example, I think, and you all agree, that of short-term uh, inadequacy of short-term solutions to complex social and ethical problems, and I would not offer you a quick, easy fix tonight either. But what I would like to leave you with is this thought. The ethics of business can't be an external norm imposed on business from outside. To be effective, business ethics needs to arise from the inherent value of business as a human activity. Not raising the bar so much as raising the moral consciousness of what they do by those in business. Religion, let's go back, and then I'll end with this, let's go back to those religious quotes. All of those religious quotes means that make sense only if you think outside the box. If you think only within a closed system, Charles Taylor, a philosopher from Montreal, calls this the closed worldview. If you think only the closed system, what uh, what is the operation, the systemic issues in business and economics, and not think of the value of business within the human context, you'll never see the inherent good of business because the inherent good of business lies in this, that it's an essential structural and organizational reality 
that we need to produce and provide those goods and services that lead to human well-being and social progress in the world. And we need business, but we need to, to help business know its relationship to us. Do you follow what I'm saying on that? Religion says to see things in, in a large scale. It rejects the idea that business is all about profits, and it rejects the idea that business is all about marketplace competition. Okay? And as I said, the, the way to enter into that change of consciousness, that change of thinking, okay, is not to abandon the public dialogue now with ethicists and people in the newspapers taking opinions through the political process or through regulation. But in the end, we know the limits of that. We know that it's not going to lie simply in bishops or rabbis or imams condemning what's going to happen or what's happened. They've done that, and we know it doesn't have an impact. It's going to happen when people who are in the work world, when, they, uh, when their conscience is picked, when they feel that there's something ethical at stake, they need to find and talk to other people and to begin to form communities that are ethical communities and that work as leaven from the inside out. These communities will help you maintain your own personal integrity in the workplace. They will help you know when your decisions are compromising your soul. Because the questions of ethics are deeply spiritual questions. They are not act answered by theory, but by action. They are, in the end, invitations to come closer to your God, to live the life of grace. And they are most readily answered, for that reason, in prayerful and faithful solidarity with other people. Thank you.